the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegan, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. That's right. With, with Arlen Reitley. Which one? Yeah, I'm right on my head. I don't know. I'm going to ask my Reitley. He's excellent. It's so wonderful to see all you people here. Baseball certainly must have been a wonderful thing and lots of history to go with it. With that, I'll send this on to... Richard Wigan from Spooner, Wisconsin, uh, with Extension Service. I'm one of the founders of this group. I'm really happy to see so many people come here tonight. Audrey Ertl, St. Nazians. Paul Jacoby, Cleveland. Carl Ziegler, Cleveland. <coughs> Lloyd Vogel, Cleveland. Gene Lutze, now Sussex, long time ago, Cleveland. Pitched for Cleveland for about 10 years or so. Thank you. Jeanette Woodsey, I'm Jean's wife. Thank you. And Vogel. And Ann Vogel. Wayne Vogel played uh, baseball from the late 50s into the 60s. Great. He was the catcher. Catcher. Thank you. Great. I'm Lee Reiterman. I played uh, from uh, 1956 through 1963 and was uh, shortstop and third base. And I'm from Sheboygan Falls. Thank you. Selma Vogel, Cleveland. Thank you. Marie Pippert, Cleveland. Thank you. Edith Lutze, Cleveland. Joy Stuckman, Cleveland. Thank you. Sharon Vogt, I am the niece of Joe Tomczyk, who was very active in the Manitowoc County Baseball League in the 30s and early 40s. Thank you. Uh, Dale Wagner, Cleveland, uh, started playing in 69 and uh, started, was the, in the manager since 1977 of the present Cleveland baseball team. And what position did you play at that time? I pitched, pitched second base and uh, I've been all over in the last 40 years. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Kathy Wagner, Cleveland. Thank you. Bob was a shortstop. Okay. Your husband's name was what again, please? Bob. Bob. Thank you. Dolores Crest, <coughs> Vernon, played ball, I don't know how many years, I can't even remember that far back no more. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Walter Crest, Cleveland. Thank you. Joe Crest, Town of Mosul. Thank you. Irene Dine, Cleveland. Thank you. Alex Mathias, Cleveland. Thank you. Willard Mathias, Cleveland, bad boy. Bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> Rick Weiersdorf, Tom Mimi. Thank you. Ron Huntsman played 51 through 61, uh, mostly third base, sometimes pitch. Very good. Thank you. Shirley Henschel, wife of Ken. Thank you. Ken Henschel, School Hill. I played from 47 for about nine years. I played every spot except catch. Okay, very good. <laughs> Thank you. We continue with the additional uh, people that have joined us this evening. Go right ahead, please. Alan Stolzman, Cleveland, uh, 1955. Thank you. 
Jim Bress, Cleveland, pitch and outfield from 58th through whenever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Marlon Mele from Kiel. I played from six, uh, 58 to uh, 67. And I played everything but first base. Okay, very good. Thank you. Rosemary Leonard, a lifelong fan. Thank you. Wally Leonard, I don't even remember when I started playing. And I quit playing when Dale took over as manager. I thought we had put a better man in place. And I <laughs> basically played outfield and first base. Thank you. I read Secret from Howard's room and pitched. Okay, thank you. Laverne <coughs> Seeger, Howard's Grove. Thank you. <coughs> Charlie Bauer, Newton. Thank you. Sammy Weisk of Sheboygan. Thank you. Danny Weisk of a from 66 to 69. Okay, very good. North Point, Manitowoc, brought my wife. Rose Reynoski, Manitowoc. Thank you. Dan Suckman, Manitowoc. Thank you. Melda Albright, Cleveland. Thank you. Jesse Huntsman, Cleveland. Thank you. Okay, got a gentleman here who'd like to introduce himself. Go right ahead, please. John Wiegan, town of Centerville. Thank you. Jerry Stolson, Manor to Walk, 61 through 69, outfield and third base. Good. Thank you. I really hope. Uh, Sheboygan County, my address, though, is Cleveland. Okay. And I played outfield for the boys. I think in 53 and 54. Very good. Thank you. Alvin Yeager, Cleveland. Thank you. <coughs> Clara Cress, uh, son of Ken, who played for a bunch of years here. Okay. Thank you. Betty Cress, Sherwood. Thank you. Sat through many games. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ken Cress, Sherwood. Thank you. Ron Prowl, Madison. I played third base. I think it was 47 when I joined the team and I played in, into my college years, but I don't remember when when I ended. Okay, well, thank you very much. Ronnie Prawl, Ron's wife. Thank you. <laughs> and my name is Jerry O'Neill, the videographer for this group, and we've been together now as a big group, rather, I would say since the year 2000, but this is absolutely the largest crowd I've ever seen. We thank you all for coming, and I'll pass this over to Kathy. I would like to thank, thank Frederick for the nice job he did and all the work he did. And you can see by the big attendance tonight that he has been quite busy these past months. We only have a few rules, and one of them is that you should raise your hand when you want to speak because that gives Jerry a chance to get over to you so we don't miss any information. Always state your full name, and when you speak about somebody, don't use nicknames, but use full names. And uh, please don't speak in the background because uh, it picks up uh, in the video. And with that, I'll turn it over to Frederick. Uh, hi. It is good that so many of you could make it, and it's good that the weatherman cooperated, too, because that could have been a problem. Um, we invited about 30 ball players, something like that, extra, and I, I wasn't able to keep track, but it looks like we have a lot of people here. Uh, we thought we would start with uh, uh, giving a, a general history about how um, Harold Wimler got the team from uh, Reeds. Who did I talk to? Who said they were going to do that? <laughs> I talked to somebody. I'm losing track. Kenny. Kenny Kress would know. Well, Kenny Kress too, maybe. Would you like to speak to him, Kenny? I thought we would move up, move up to the years, <laughs> and maybe uh, by sections of years, it occurred to me that maybe we could take all the years up to World War II, where we finally got a, a definitive, definitive answer from Wally Leonard that said there was no team here for several of the war years. And, uh, so, and then we could pick up a, for people to make comments and so on. And uh, there are various things that people have and they'll show them when they get a chance. And I don't know, is that about cover it, do you think? Oh, well, that's fine. I mean, right. I'm making this up as I go along, you know. Okay, uh, we got a gentleman here who would like to talk a little bit. Go right ahead, please. Uh, my first experience with Cleveland. Hold it, I need your name, please. Oh, Ken Chris Sherwood, Sherwood now. Okay, thank but you. I played in Cleveland, or I was bat boy first, went to ball. Can't hear you. Real close. Real close. 
I, I was bad boy in 19. Is it coming through now? Yep. Sure. sure. Oh, okay. If you can talk a little louder, be appreciated. Okay. At least, and from there we went for bailets, bailets, the corner of bailets, and whatever. <laughs> and then we we moved how many two three times. And I stayed, was here until 1951. I managed and done whatever. I got pictures. I got pictures of Harold and and the whole team. Uh, Harold. Uh, what, what was Harold's name? Harold Wimler. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. At least. Uh, so. I don't. I don't know what else to say. But I, could I ask a question? Sure. Who sponsored you? Uh, Harold did. Harold did? Okay. Great. Okay, and if you got a picture, maybe Fred can help you a little bit there to hold it up and identify some people. That's a that's the old old picture from way back. I'm not even on there. I was bad boy about that time. Could you give us a year approximately? 1945. 1945. Okay. Earlier. Would that be the team before World War II? I'm looking at names. There's Pippert and some names that I'm thinking. The team before World War II. Yeah, I think so. From seeing the names, I'm guessing. I think the present team started in 47. That you, could be. You guys paid for Bill Reed in 46. Yep. And yep. Wimbler bought the team and brought it down to Cleveland That's right. in 47. Yeah. And the land where the diamond is now belongs to the town of Centerville. Oh, Ken Henschel from School Hill. And uh, some of the guys like Kenny Kress, Jimmy Dine, Bobby Wagner, they played for Bill Reed. And then Harold Wimler bought the team from Bill Reed and moved it to Cleveland okay. in 47, I'm quite sure. Okay. Could and I that's the first year that I played All right. for Cleveland. Could I ask you another question? Bill Reed, where did he come from? Where was his location? He had the bar in School Hill. Oh. He, had a, he had a softball team that played right behind the bar, and the hardball team played down in Osmond by oh. the bullpen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anything else, sir? Making the diamond. Well, in 47, that's when we made the diamond. It was just a rough field. Got ground hauled in with the rakes and stuff, and... <laughs> Leveled out the diamond, Wimbler at the old drag behind the car, dragged the infield. <laughs> and again, can you pinpoint the location of that diamond? It's where it's right now. Oh, it's where it's right now? Yep, that's where the field was where we started out playing hardball in Cleveland. Okay. Just where the hardball field is. The rest below all got added in the later years. Okay. Very good. Anything else that uh, you can recall? Uh, who you played against, maybe? Oh, the, a lot of teams. Rockwood, Morrison, Wayside, Kellnersville, Sanesians. Sanesians was always a big rivalry. Okay. Francis Crick. Francis Crick. Oh. Kellnersville. Kellnersville to Rivers. Okay. And there were a lot of teams. Okay. We played, we started in mid-April and played till end of September to play home and home yeah. series with yeah. each team. That's so many hardball teams there were in the league. Wow. Wow. And again, can you give me the years of that era? Well, I'd say from 40, 47, that's when Wimler started the team in Cleveland. Okay. From there on. From there on. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Go right ahead, sir. We need your name, please. Uh, Richard Wigan. A couple of quick questions. What was the name of the team? What was the name of the league? And, and who were the other, were there other leagues in the area at different levels, that sort of thing? Okay, yeah. go right ahead, sir. We were in the Manitowoc County League, and there was, that was the only league that we... They had a bigger league, Manitowoc Rivers, yeah. uh, the Pana, that, that's where the polar bears played. That's right, but we didn't have to get into that. No. Okay, very good. What was the name of the team? Just mm -hmm. name we, we didn't have a nickname, did we? No, I don't think so. Cleveland. Okay, okay I've got a gentleman here who will identify himself, please. Go right ahead. I'm Ron Prawl. Uh, the, the name of the team was the Cleveland Indians. 
I have a little token in my pocket here that uh, Great. even verifies that uh, <laughs> the, small, the smaller one will indicate the, that the name of the team is Indians, and then this larger one is a, uh, uh, I forget the year, 52 or 53, we, we ended up in second place, and we ended up all getting this little uh, uh, token. Okay. Indians. Cleveland Indians, and that was a token? With the, with the baseball, was that a token for uh, winning something? Yeah. That I don't remember. Okay. I, 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 I honestly don't remember the, why we got it. Okay. But I know it's been in my jewelry box for <laughs> forever. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we got another uh, baseball memento, which was given out apparently for uh, uh, something that was achieved. And maybe, Richard, you can indicate what you've read. It says second 51 MCL, Manitowoc County League, I presume 1951, okay. second place. Okay, very good. Thank, thank you. Okay, we got a gentleman here who's ready to speak, and he'd like to start out by telling us his name, please. I'm Ken Kress, I can, and I think we got that out at uh, Silver Lake, uh, some kind of annual doings or whatever. Okay. For second place in the county league, I think. All right, very good. Was that where Oakers Hall was located in that area? Do you remember? No. No. Uh, got a gentleman here who said he has some information. Go right ahead, please. This is Ken Henschel. Thank you. The ballpark you were talking about was Houts, Alverno. Okay. What's uh, Silver, Lake. Silver Lake now? Okay. Silver Valley. Silver Valley. That go. was a big, he always had a good team, too. Oh, okay. Okay. Deal out. Yep. He played football for the Bears after a while. All right. <laughs> Okay, and that location of the diamond was in that basic area there. Right. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, got a gentleman here who uh, did a lot of work, as Kathy mentioned, but he's ready to go. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Fred Jacoby. Uh, we got the names here that uh, Kenny has for the picture. And starting up on the upper left, it's just Tom Schick, number one. Oh, it's Joe? Okay. And the second one is Francis Pippard. Uh, then number three is Gerhard Stark, who was invited, by the way. Uh, but I, I, is he here? I don't know. I missed him if he's here. He's invited. He lives in Sheboygan. He's 90 years old. Uh, oh, and then uh, Ed Yost. Ed Yost. And then Bud Jacoby. Abenki. No, no first name. And then Willard with a question mark, Reinemann. Then the front row, on the left, uh, Melvin Stark. That's Gary Hart's, or Gary's brother, and Melvin's no longer living. Uh, Milt Newald, Harold Wimler, uh, Gordon Gifford, Alden Boland, Harold Cull, Robert Gifford, and Joe Tomshek. Now how come Joe Tomshek's on there twice? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but are they both Joes? No. No, Joes. Joes identified positively on the lower right, so maybe the other time check is a different time check. This kid was before World War Two. Yeah. 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 We just have two time checks and one time check, no first name. Yeah. Is the question. So there's a little question mark there. Thank you. Okay. At least uh, I got a score book here okay. from May eighth, nineteen forty nine. And you want the names of yes, the players please. on that? Yes, sir. Bob Wagner, Marv Siegert, L. Ray Worthman, Jim Dine, and I was the catcher, Ron Prowl. He's here. Kenny Henschel, Roger Yost, Milt Ewald, and Hank Sen. Okay, thank you. Keep standing, sir. Okay, this gentleman did not stand, but he told me he did what for the team at that time? What was your position? I was a catcher. You were the catcher. Okay, great. Thank you. I got the fingers to prove it. <laughs> Good. Let me see that hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, you were the catcher, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Gene. Pitched in the 50s for Cleveland. Anyhow, I have here... 
a Manitowoc County Baseball League 1951 official schedule. Oh, great. And the team directory, the league directory at that time, Hults Bar, Francis Crick, Kellnersville, Cleveland, Two Rivers, St. Nazians, Whitelaw, Morrison, the Vikings, which was outside of uh, Valders, and Michicot. Whoa. Those were the teams in the league in 1951. Okay. I got to ask a question. Yes, sir. Did they have a age limit as to who, when you could start to play or when you had to quit? No, nothing at all. And that reminds me, I was going to ask Ronnie Prawl how young he was when he started playing. I was 13. I just graduated from, uh, from eighth grade. Super. Super. He was 13? He was 13. But oh. no, there were no age limits. Okay. I got two little quick stories to tell you. Go right ahead. The first one, and I think this could have been 51 when I just made the team, and Harold Wimler was going to take a couple guys down to a Chicago Cup game. And I know it was Roger Yost, and I don't know who else. I think it could have been Hank Semp and myself. And I was like 17 at the time. And this was a big deal because I had probably not been out of Sheboygan or Manitowoc County, maybe Brown County when we played Morrison and Wayside. But anyhow, we're, we're getting close to Chicago and into Chicago. And Harold Wimler had a pretty heavy foot. He used to drive pretty, pretty good. People remember that. Anyhow, we're driving along, and Harold said, what is the speed limit? Roger Yost sitting next to him said, five miles faster than what you're going. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I don't remember if the Cubs won, who they played, anything. Okay. And one other one, how many guys here remember the day we burned the infield? You burned the infield? We burned the infield on a Sunday morning. It had rained Saturday night, and there were puddles, and the field wasn't very level, of course, and we had water standing, and it was muddy. As the guys came home from church and went over to the diamond, Somebody, Kenny Cress was one of them because he was working at the Cleveland Co-op. Him and Jimmy Dine had access to the gas pumps. <laughs> they went over and I don't know how many gallons of gas they got. We spread them around on the infield with rakes and set the thing on fire. That was around noon. We played the game at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Dry, <laughs> dry infield. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. appreciate that. Great. Got a gentleman here who will raise his hand. Go right ahead, please. Hi, this is Ron Prawl. We've been, I've been hearing you talk about the, uh, the start of the new baseball field, uh, and uh, I just remember one, one uh, incident so vividly in my mind because it just shocked the H out of me, uh, with Roger Yost. I was about 13 or 14 years old at that point, and the field, as you were describing it, was just being put together, and uh, we needed a, a drinking fountain. And uh, well, Roger and I, one afternoon, went out and we were walking around the uh, field and Roger brought another fellow along whose name I do not really know, but he was one of these guys that could take a branch and go and walk around and then all of a sudden this branch would dip and that's where the water was. That, to me, that was a miracle. <laughs> but that's really how we first developed the first a drinking fountain at the at the baseball field. Now I don't think that you had the the same drinking fountain is there anymore because it was quite close to the right field line, and uh, it would, would actually be a danger to, to the right fielder coming over for the foul ball. But uh, I just thought that was very interesting. Very good, very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, you got a gentleman who raised his hand. He'll identify himself. Go right ahead, please. Arlen Ridley from Keel. Okay, uh, if you remember the Cleveland ball team before, or the field before it got the way it is now, wasn't a real good field, but this was in the uh, late 50s. Uh, a fellow by the name of Slugger Henschel, uh, Sam, uh, liberal Henschel. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, he usually came to the ball game. He wasn't in the best of shape from Saturday night. <laughs> and uh, you want to know a story? Well, one Sunday we were, we were warming up before the game. I mean, Wogel over there was chewing a big bag of planter peanuts in his mouth. And Slugger wasn't feeling too well. So Wayne tapped Slugger on the shoulder and he went, ah! And Slugger looked at his mouth and all them peanuts in there. So he turned around and he filled up one of them gopher holes. So that was about the best story that I had. Thank you. Thank you. We got a gentleman here who raised his hand. Go right ahead, please. I'm Wally Leonard 
Cleveland. Uh, just a little bit of the background on, on the diamond from where it is today. This is the third location it's had okay. in basically the same area. Okay. The very first home plate would have been down near where the flag is now when you come into the park on the east side. And I remember as a young boy watching games out there where the right field line ended about 40 or 50 feet behind first base and that was a five strand barbed wire fence. So the right fielder, if he went too far over, was in real, real trouble. Oh. <laughs> then uh, in uh, about 1950 or 51, then it, the field was moved to uh, what would have been, the home plate would have been basically in the middle of what's now the tennis courts. And then, uh, you know, they got a little more room. And then in the, in the middle 70s, 74, 75, it was moved to its present location. But yeah, it's it, things been moved around a little bit, but we got it set up pretty decent. We got decent lines now, and, and everything. It's it's a lot better shape. I know Ken was referring to Harold dragging that field with his old Ford car. I can remember that three two by sixes nailed together, and he dragged that infield. <laughs> it was rougher than a corn cob. <laughs> we have a gentleman raise his hand. Go right ahead, please. This is Ken Henschel again. One thing when Harold Ma Wimler managed the team, he coached third base with his flashlight in the pocket. That was a must. He had that in the back pocket all the time. <laughs> Just the, one of his uh, unique things, right? Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Got a gentleman raise his hand. Go right ahead, please. Hello. My name is Arley Hout. And when you heard that name, Hout, I know Kenny Henschel and other ones were mentioning that we played against the Houts quite a bit. And they were always quite a challenge. I got a picture here that was from 1947 or 1948. Okay. And I'm a bat boy down on the bottom there with my brother Glenn. Okay. And I think a lot of the names in back here the guys would remember. Can you read them off? Some of them that played there was uh, Milton Hope was the owner and he took care of the team. There was Laverle Butleski. I know he played first base. Uh, John Weyer, Al Luzier. Uh, I went to school with Al Luzier at Manitowoc. And then there was Dale Hout. And then there was a Jimmy Meyer, a Chet Strofeld. Chet Strofeld lived out in Newton. And then there was Breezy Brinza. He was the manager. And then there was a Delmer Lettenberger. And then a Johnny Osasonic and a Helmer Moody Learman, he married my first cousin. <laughs> and then there was a Marshall Hine, he was the pitcher. And he was kind of hard to hit. Uh, I never had no luck against him. I think quite a few remember Marshall Hine as the pitcher. And then there's a Fred Hine, his brother, and my other cousin was Wayne Hout, was on the team. And this picture was taken out at Francis Crick in 1947 or 48, and there is a St. Anne church in the background. And I can remember playing there where we had that church in the background when I played for Cleveland. I'm sure that Kenny and maybe Eugene, Ron, where? some of you, where? in Francis, Francis Crick. We played behind a church. Yeah, 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 that church you can see well in this picture here in the background. Okay. If you'd like to see it over here somewhere and just show it, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Word by identifying himself, first of all. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Lee Reineman, and uh, not quite sure. I, I have an old picture here, which I have given to uh, Wayne Vogel, and uh, he and his wife brought it along tonight. Uh, this this picture, just, I'll, I'll just mention a few names on here. Uh, Henry Dersh, Otto Dersh, Elmer Lutze, Adrian Reiner, Eddie Bergner, Eddie Edmund Dersh, Laverell Vogel, Clarence Whitty, just to mention a few. This picture has to have been taken somewhere between 1925 and 1930. I, there's probably no one here tonight who uh, remembers the, this particular group as a team. However, I, I think it's quite interesting. And like I said earlier on, I don't know how we got this picture, but after my father passed away, we came across it in his house. I don't know. I don't believe he took it, but he did have this picture. And, it's 
Just one second. Bo Agner from Cleveland. Thank you. Uh, I have some pictures here from, I have the dates that are back in the 30s. I thought maybe, that I'm not sure, but I got them from the, from the Dershes and we used them here last May in Sheboygan uh, when they had a baseball day at uh, the museum in Sheboygan and there, there's some names back here that are, I don't know, I haven't heard here yet tonight, Harvey, okay. Harvey Vandaloo and uh, Wilbur Casper on here and there's some question marks and Fran Groth as a bat boy and uh, Elmer Lutze and one here is a player, uh, Elmer Groupie, Orville Grudigut, Laverle Vogel, and uh, one here also from the 30s, it's quite old, uh, Gardner, Brady, Grotegut, Eddie Dersh, Louis Lewis, and a lot. Some of these names, uh, I guess we have to go over to some people that are a little bit uh, back, but if you'd like to put these up, uh, Very good. you could do it also. Thank you. And uh, I know Harold, you talked about Harold uh, doing it with the uh, car dragging the infield. Uh, that's just something that comes with managing. I know I've done that with a 1941, if I'm reading that 49, right. 49. 49, I'm sorry. 49. 1949. From the All Star Game, Veterans Memorial Park, Valders, North versus South, All Stars, Wednesday, August 9th. Uh, the year is 49. And we'll just name off the, uh, the South All Stars, which is a note down here that they won. And uh, the, the players from Cleveland were Simph, was pitching, um, uh, Jibo was an infielder, Wagner infielder, uh, outfield was Dine, and then the manager was Kenny Cress, and uh, it's, it's interesting because I don't know if that's the article I read about, but it could be out of Kathy Wagner's scrapbook, uh, because I have a note on that, that uh, Kenny was the manager of the South uh, team in, a, in an all-star game and uh, the sports writers did a great job of writing up those ball games and I made a bunch of excerpts that if there's time I'd like to uh, share with everybody and he's referred to as Cleveland's genial mentor. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. A young lady raised her hand. I'm Kathy Sixel and I want to know um, Kenny, who kept score in, in the, those score books? Were there different people or was it always one person? Hey, there's a question on the floor pertaining to score markers and maybe this gentleman can identify himself and tell us about it. This is Ken Henschel again. Ronnie Prowls, that Ruben, and uh, Whips Casper was a score marker. And uh, Art Gupsch, he collected uh, the, the entrance fee or the for many, many years with his little cigar box he ran around. <laughs> and who was that again, please? Art Gupsch. He was Art a, Gupsch. He lived out by uh, Grove's Tavern. Okay. Out there. And when we had, after a number of games, we'd fry out at the park. We'd set up a keg of beer and fry hamburgers and brats. And Art Gupsch ate everything that was left. <laughs> <laughs> he was good for about five or six double brats. <laughs> Okay, uh, you mentioned a name, sir, and it was a nickname, I'm sure. It was Whips somebody. Wilbert Casper. Wilbert Casper. Thank yes. you very much. A gentleman here who would like to identify himself. Go right ahead, please. Dale Wagner from Cleveland. Uh, you were on the subject here of uh, scorekeeping and score marking. I guess as uh, the present caretaker of records and that, I would, I would be interested if anybody would have old score books or 
or sheets with averages in from years ago. Uh, Wally kept records since 1958. Now I've been continuing, so so it is getting to be 50 years of, of records here, but it just looks a little incomplete after I see all this uh, history here already, and I'm only starting at 1958. You know, there's Roger Yost is 0 for 4. I guess Rock, that was his last year he played, but so it doesn't look very good. But, <laughs> but if you're uh, if you're just curious, from 1958, uh, we've uh, Cleveland has had 7,491 hits and 28,510 at bats for a 2.63 average. Wow! So Whoa. that's what you can do now with computers. It kind of helps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's Very all good. I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, got a young lady who raised her hand and she'd like to identify herself and tell us a little more history. Go right ahead, please. My name is Sharon Vogt and I'm from Manitowoc and I'm the niece of Joe Tomchik, who was uh, a member of the Point Creek baseball team in the Manitowoc County League in the more early years of the 1930s and just early 40s. I guess we have some of their little charms here too that apparently I gather they were handed out as, as their prizes uh, at their banquets and it, one of these is stamped champions 1934 which would be the Point Creek team. Now the Tomchick family did own Point Creek Park and that was one of the sites where uh, the Manitowoc County League baseball games were played. Could I interrupt for a moment? Could you point out a location of that particular park at all in some way? The park was uh, located, I believe it is the town of Centerville, and it was on the very, very, uh, it was Point Creek Park, and right now I think it is designated as a natural preserve. It was on the very south end of the uh, town of Centerville. So it was, <coughs> pardon me. North end, pardon me. Okay, and it was right near Lake Michigan, right? Yes, it was. Point Creek, okay. um, the Point Creek River. You know, emptied into the lake. Okay. In fact, actually, I guess I remember him telling me lots of stories about this baseball league and balls would go into the river and they would have to go and retrieve the balls with a little rowboat. <laughs> uh, I did bring along, it is the bat bag. Now, there are bats in there basically to hold the bag up, but this is an original bag that they used to transport their ba uh, uh, bats from one baseball site to another. And uh, so that would be like in the 1930s, so it's fairly old. He passed that down to me. <laughs> I also have pictures here of banquets that the Manitowoc County League had. This one takes place at Silver Lake. And this is, uh, you can see the large groups so it was really, I can remember his stories, that this was the entertainment that they had in those days. It was during the Depression. There are, um, I collected many pictures here, gathered many pictures. Uh, most of them are not identified. The years are on there, but uh, the people are not. Uh, he, he was a... Uh, he always kept memorabilia, and that, of course, he did pass down to me also because he was the fellow that got me interested in baseball. I'm kind of a baseball fan myself and have always been. Um, there's pictures of the team. He has pictures here of, of uh, the umpires. And I guess this would be the picture of the Point Creek team. Maybe it would be that year when they were champions. A few years ago, I... This Cleveland State Bank uh, celebrated their 100th anniversary, and I was contacted by, I believe, kind of their public relations person there, and she did take some pictures, and that picture of this baseball team appeared in your calendar in July. You hold that up. And I was very happy, and it was 
really pleased that she, she did call. I was very happy to share this. And there's also a picture of the park, because it was a very popular park in the area here, even into the 1950s until 1960, when my aunt and uncle did sell the farm and move to Manitowoc. Anything else at this point? I don't think so. Is there okay. any questions? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you got a young lady here who had her hand up a little bit, and she'd like to indicate her name and maybe a lot more information. Go right ahead, please. I'm Joyce Stuckman. Uh, my uncle Al Murotic, uh used to use this bat in the 1930s, playing on the Point Creek team. And there is uh, a picture of when they were the All-Stars, you know, Point Creek baseball team, All-Star team in 1937. And my dad also played, and uh, Uncle Al's brother, Eddie, and there was kind of a fun little story about that, but it would be too long to, I mean, too much to read right now. So that's really all I have. I, I also have one of those little trinkets like they have. Okay. Uh, this is just the way it was given. This is from 1933. Okay. And it does say uh, Mantle County League or, or MTL on there. And when they were, they came in second or something. Um, so, so what re really did happen is that this Point Creek team was in the Mantle County League. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. M MTL, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did it evolve into the Cleveland team or how did that work? I don't think so. I don't know. Oh, okay. All right. I we have a young lady who raised her hand, and she'd like to uh, add some more information. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Sharon Volt from Manitowoc. I, I just would uh, add a little bit about this Point Creek team and, and the teams in that era. That uh, I remember my uncle telling me that evidently they were pretty good baseball players. And they were invited uh, to Milwaukee. I believe at the time there was a baseball team here, a triple-A league baseball or a double-A baseball league and they were invited for tryouts. Wow. I think he and a couple of his teammates. Okay. But I think as a story he told me that I, I just don't know how it turned out, but he questioned even going further with it because he felt that he was needed on the farm. Okay. Thank you. We got a gentleman here who uh, raised his hand a little bit on my way through and he'd like to add information. I'm just wondering if there's any Pardon me, Willard. Okay. Your name please? Willard Mathias. Thank you, Willard. <laughs> I'm just wondering if anybody here has a picture of the old stadium that they, they had on Center Street. Because uh, it, to me, when I was a little boy, I used to be down there a lot and, and I'd have to chase the foul balls and, and things, you know, being around there. And you'd see these fellows at night practicing almost every night. There'd be somebody there pushing a lawnmower. They didn't have no electric lawnmowers. They pushed it, and they cleaned that, that place up. Uh, uh, to me, this was uh, the best diamond in the whole Manitowoc County. Mm -hmm. But they had a uh, state league at that time where like, uh, a lot of these good players played in another league beside the Manitowoc County. This was all before the war. And uh, it, it's just uh, uh, people would be coming from all over to watch these guys play ball. And uh, I said, like Eddie Bergner, he, he next day he would say, oh, my whole hand is sore. He was a catcher. And the Darish boys, they were in there playing ball. And um, it, it was just an outstanding diamond to, to me. And well, I was, when they moved the diamond over to the Pippert Park over there, uh, I didn't see any pictures of that here either. That That's when I got to be up on the ladder. I got to be the bat boy and carry the water for the boys and chase for the foul balls. That was my job. And I got out of working at home in the cheese factory. I didn't have to go in there. But I would just love to see some of these old time pictures from the Pippets and uh, uh, the one diamond he started in. Thank okay. you. Very good, thank you. A gentleman here who raised his hand, it was pertaining to the Point Creek baseball team. Could they have gone into the Cleveland team? Uh, this is Ken Enschel again. Thank you. Uh, Point Crick had a team and Cleveland had a team. Oh, really? Okay. The Tom Checks, the Grody Goods, they played for Point Crick. And the second year I played ball, we played against a bunch of old-timers, a preseason game, and Orville Grody Good 
that was a pitcher for the uh, Point Creek team. He was 71 years old. He pitched five innings. He was. He lived in Milwaukee at that time. But he was 71 years old. Holy. Man. A little add-on information. Go right ahead, please. Yeah. Is there any information? Cleveland had a fast-pitch softball team too. Is there any information on that? Okay. Thank you. I got a gentleman here who I spoke to just a few minutes ago, and he'd like to start something with a little information, and maybe people can give him a hand and help him out too. Go right ahead, please. Yes, this is Ronnie Hansman from Cleveland, and I I played. I played with the team from 51 through 61, and what I remember most is, I think it was 1956 when we owed the league about $180, <laughs> and they wouldn't <coughs> let us play that year unless we came up with $180. So Harold had a cigar box under the bar, and I asked Harold if he'd, he'd mind if I'd take over the financial end of the, the that so we could stay in the league and not, you know, end up with the team splitting up or whatever. And he, and he did give me the box and he said, go ahead. He was really happy about it. So we had our first midwinter mid -winter broad fry. We didn't hear about this for, you know, in the area at all. And I think it was maybe the, <coughs> excuse me, the first midwinter broad fry ever in the area. And we accumulated the money so we could stay in the league and we continued on in the league as a result of that, I think. And uh, and we've been having midwinter broad fries to raise money and for many years Good. since that time. So just thought if it was an information that somebody had forgotten about or didn't remember. And if, I, if there's any corrections, please tell me. Thank you. We got a young lady who raised her hand. She'd like to uh, tell us what it's all about. Go right ahead, please. Betty Chris. And I'm wondering why some of the men that are here tonight aren't at the Old Timers uh, reunion that Manitowoc County has. It's always over at Kellnersville or uh, in that area every summer. Okay, thank you. Okay, got a gentleman who raised his hand. Ronnie Huntsman again. Ronnie Huntsman again. I'm trying to answer her question over there. The reason that there's a lot of people that have not gone to that is we never were invited to it. <laughs> and so it wasn't until the later years that we were invited and then we went a couple years and then we either got too old to drive or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got a gentleman who raised his hand. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Richard Wiegand, um, Art Gupsch consumed 12 double brats. <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing that a number of times, and I also remember him when I was growing up. Um, I don't know how many of you here ever tried to hit against Robert Lack, Bobby Lack from Howard's Grove. He played in the Shoreland League. And I remember reading an, a newspaper article about him that he averaged 21 strikeouts a game during one year and, and struck out 27 one year, uh, or one game. And uh, I know that he flirted with the major leagues and I never qu wasn't quite sure why he never went, but I probably would have seen him pitch probably in the 60s sometime because I used to go to a number of games in Cleveland. But uh, I'd just like anybody to share any stories about Bobby Locke. Got a gentleman here who raised his hand on a question if he remembered the other pitcher in the league. Go right ahead. I'm Wally Leonard. Do I remember Bobby Locke? I think I played against the son of a gun for about 15 years. <laughs> he was almost impossible to hit. He threw, uh, well, first I'll try to answer your question about, I know he tried out with the, uh, what was then the Milwaukee Braves, but I, if I'm not mistaken, he was real close to or was already married, and uh, the money they offered him he didn't think was good enough to you know, to try to follow the baseball path. But yeah, he was a very, very good pitcher for a heck of a lot of years. As long as, in my memory, in all the games we ever played against him, I think we only beat him twice. And once was a one to nothing game, and Jim Bruss was the guy that pitched that shot out for us. <laughs> he happened to pitch that the day after his brother got married. He was so hungover, he didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah Bob pitched, pitched a lot of years. He, you're right, he did a mess. 
I don't know how many strikeouts he averaged in any one season, but I know it was an awful lot. He was very, very good. Thank you. We got a gentleman here who was kind of shy about his achievements. Go right ahead, please. <laughs> there weren't many Jim Brust here. Uh, someone had mentioned before about age. Was there an age limit way back when, when they were playing like 13, Ronnie started stuff? Well, I know there was no age limit for drinking. <laughs> I started, I think I played, for, I started at 16, 17 years old, something like that. We were, we had a really good team. I mean, it was growing up, but we, we had to get outside players. Now, Locke, the bastard, was good. <laughs> but they had a lot of good players. I mean, they had guys from Madison all over, a lot of Lakeland players over the years and stuff. But we got three guys from Sheboygan. <laughs> Danny Weisskopf, Jim Lallemont, and Jim Cullen, yeah. and a pitcher from Manitowoc by the name of Lon Gall. He was, I think he signed with Boston, or tried out for Red Sox at one year, a guy from Manitowoc. Put us over to Hump when we won the championship in 68 yeah, against Two Rivers, I think it was. Uh, but we we're, were pretty good. We had a lot of good ball players, but we had, a, we, were, we had an import enough to get us over to Hump. But Howard's was a nemesis, and we had some battles with them, and uh, we didn't win enough. Like you said, I think we, we, you know, Locke beat us every time. We won a couple, two or three times, but we had some good ball games against them. It just, uh, we had too much. But in that era, I tell you, we, we had, I think, one of the best hitting teams that, uh, that I was, I don't know, I played 15 years or something like that, that you could get. I mean, there are some pretty gaudy averages, and you know, even Wally Leonard, of course, he had to put his name on here. Uh, <laughs> in 1960, he hit 500, Ooh. but he only batted eight times. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of misleading. Danny Weiska, for example, 409, Jerry Stolzman in there at 375. It was just a good team. Wow. And uh, all the years of the good teams, we only won one championship. So I guess we weren't that good, but it was a good, good era that we went through that time. And I did get the pitch with Howard. At that time, there was a tournament, state tournament. You pick up players, you know, just semi-pro, amateur, whatever you want to call it. And Howard was always, a, always was in that thing. And they got a Donnie Held from Houstonsford. You need a lot of pitchers because it was back-to-back -back games. We played at County Stadium. So I got the pitch a second game. We played a team from Madison. And I, over the years, I, Dale and Wally would. Jerry and Danny, I remember that. I had a little control problems. <laughs> in fact, I do want to claim the fact that in Cleveland's Park, I think I was the reason they changed the back stuff from chicken wire to this real heavy <laughs> stuff, you know. But just one thing about a pitch against Pepin Lake from Madison, the second game. And if you remember Old County Stadium, or County Stadium center field was 402 feet. We did lose the game, by the way. I mean, I was walking guys all over the place and stuff. But a guy hit a line drive off me off the 402 mark. I never saw that sucker. I heard it go past me. <laughs> so that was kind of the down. I started thinking about other things. The baseball, you know, when that happened. But, but I want to give credit to three people. I mean, sir, I served with Harold Wimler. I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, you guys going back here before a really long time. But Harold Wimler. Wally Leonard and Dale Wagner are the reason there was so much baseball in this area for all these years. And okay. I got a question for you, Jim. Yeah. Uh, I myself played for Osmond softball, you know, the w wussy game. <coughs> but anyway, in our area there, we had to find our own sponsors, and they'd put their name on your back of your uh, uniform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would pay for your uniform. Was that ever a condition with the Cleveland ball team? Oh man, I don't think I don't remember that. No. The chamber, we had the chamber on the Chamber, oh. chamber of commerce. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah. you were sponsored by one local sponsor. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And the sponsors are always. Can you name a few of those? Well, yeah, two of the really important ones. Was a member of Bushman's Tavern in Cleveland, and that Steggy had a tavern up in at the old tourist inn, Brett's yeah. type thing. Yeah. Well, we beat Horace Grove. We what? We have a quarter barrel from each or a half barrel from each. 
<laughs> you know, there were days that Monday mornings when you, I was working at Kohler at the time, when you got up on Monday mornings, there were times you knew you beat Howard's or beat somebody or won a championship if you woke up and you still had your uniform on. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, it sure wasn't me, no, it was our man, it started with the manager. <laughs> Yeah, that was really, it was a great time, I mean, and good. just like the times in the 30s and 40s, I mean, it was just good good stuff. Glad you enjoyed those yeah. days, too. Thank, Thank you. you. You got a gentleman raise his hand, he's got some things to tell. I'm Wally Leonard, and uh, I'm going to tell a story out of school now, Dan. Jim was talking about waking up with your uniform on in the morning. Well, the year that we won the championship, 1968, by the way, the picture is over there on the other side right now. You can see that when it comes around, it's got a champion little sign on it. Okay. But anyway, that summer, I would get phone calls starting sometimes Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, even as late as Wednesday or Thursday from people out in the area in the town that had parts of the uniform and they wanted to know who the hell it belonged to. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times it was number four, my catcher, <laughs> Danny Weisskopf. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, I'm not always really sure what these guys did after the games, but I know those parts of the uniform kept coming into me from all over the place. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just one other little thing too about Harold Wimler. Ken was mentioning uh, about him managing and coaching with his flashlight in his pocket. What I remember most about him was uh, his idea of a first aid kit was a seven ounce bottle of water that he'd come running with. I remember a game I played, I believe it was up at Kellner's Well, and I, I was always dumb enough as a hitter, I didn't want to give in to the pitcher. And he had a big, lanky side armor. And that right-hander was throwing at me, and it looked like he was going to hit you. Every every pitch looked like it was going to hit you. Well, I never moved out of the way. That guy got me three times and four at bats. <laughs> the last time he hit me behind the ear, I had an egg on my head, and I remember Harold coming running out with his little water bottle. Are you all right? Are you all right? We only got nine guys. You got to play. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, all right. Thank you. Harold Umer's daughter. Okay. I emailed my brother and he, he emailed me back. Oh. I remember one game. Do not remember the team we played, but Cleveland was leading 12 to 3. Dad put in the subs in the ninth inning. They tied us up and we lost 18th inning, 13 to 12. <laughs> <laughs> Another game with Kellner's going, he, I think. Hank Sim hit a single, a double, a triple, and a home run in one game. I learned my first son of a bitch from Rob Pipper. I was five or six years old and dad would take me to ball practice. When Rob would miss a ball, he would say that, and I picked it up. Mom wanted to know where I learned that and I told her where. <laughs> thank you. Very good, thank you. We got a young lady who's been with us uh, since the very start here and she's doing a good job. Go right ahead, please, and identify yourself. I'm Marie Pippert. In regard to this picture, now, see, my, my brother's on here, and he was born in 1900, and he got married in 1928. So all of these guys, I think, are single on here yet. And this was at uh, Marie. Washington. Marie. Oh, Washington, Washington <laughs> and uh, Center Street, the old uh, favorite slot. And I remember that uh, it had a wooden fence all the way around, and my dad had a garage, and I remember it said on the Albert Lutze garage, I suppose they all paid to advertise. But I often wondered if, if they had a manager. They probably didn't have any. <laughs> the Vero Vogel is the manager. Yeah, so. The Vero Vogel? Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, I see that now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, I don't think any of them are married on here, okay. so it must have been about, if, if they got married in, in 28, it must have been, uh, 23, 24, something like that, I would think, right. I don't know. All right, thank you. There's a picture shown, the previous, and it, uh, a question came to the floor, where was it taken and so forth, and maybe this young lady can tell us. Go right ahead. 
Uh, my name is Sharon Bolt, and it is uh, the picture I would be identified as Mantua County League Banquet in 1933. Okay, and the location and of the, that? The location uh, would be Oakers okay. at Silver Lake. At Silver Lake. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, I got a gentleman here who said he had something to indicate here. Go right ahead, please. Yeah. Hold um, it. <laughs> Name, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lee Reinemann. And uh, this is something that uh, that happened before I, I played ball. When I, when I was a kid out on the farm, I would uh, really enjoy those Sunday afternoons going to the uh, Cleveland ball games, hopping on my bike and pedaling over there and taking in those games. And at the time, uh, I would try to convince my dad to go to the uh, Cleveland co-op to have his feet mixed on Mondays. And the reason being, he didn't understand it at first, but after a while he figured it out. But the reason being that uh, Kenny Cress and uh, Jimmy Dine both played for Cleveland and both worked at the co-op. And I could, as about a 12-year-old or whatever I was at the time, I could uh, talk baseball with these actual baseball players. And I, I thought that was really quite a thing. This was back in the era when uh, I know Marvin Siegert was pitching, Bobby Wagner was a short, Ron Prowl was a third. I think Kenny Henschel was probably in the outfield at that time. I know Jimmy Dine for sure was. And um, it, was, it was quite exciting. That, that, was one of, that was a big thrill for me. And then after I, I did start playing, I'll relate this story too. Um, I was playing, one of the first years that I was playing, it was at third base. Wally Leonard was our manager. And uh, the uh, Cleveland dugout is on the third base side. And while I'm at third base, he's telling me, there was, apparently there was a runner at first, and he said to me, uh, Lee, he's going to bunt, move in. Lee, he's going to bunt, move in. Well, I kept moving in, and I kept moving in more and more, and he said, a step or two more, I'd leave. Move on in. Well, if I would have gotten much closer, I think I could have smelled his breath. <laughs> and uh, he did. I don't know if, if they took the bun sign off or what happened, but at any rate, the guy did swing away and he hit a line shot down the third base line. And I felt pretty good because I hit the deck pretty quick and I did not get hit. The guy ended up getting a triple or something like that, but I, I felt pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Got a gentleman here. Was Char here Charlie question? Bauer here. I was just wondering, nobody talked about umpires yet. Was the manager responsible for hiring an umpire for the game, or was that done by the county? Or uh, Can somebody explain that? Thank you. A question on the floor was pertaining to umpires and so forth, and who paid them, and uh, this gentleman will identify himself. Go right ahead, please. Uh, this is Ken Angel again. Uh, the umpires were... Uh, appointed by the league or, or hired by the league. And when I started playing, we had one umpire that umped home plate and the bases, not two and three like you see now. And there were some pretty, there was a guy by the name of Lamish. You threw a curveball at the plate that the batter couldn't reach with a six foot bat, he'd still call it a strike. <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't know if you remember Bob Sullivan from Manitowoc, not the young fella, the father, okay. he umped and oh, there were a number of other ones, but the teams had a pay, the home teams had a pay for the umpire, but you more or less signed up with the league to hump, and then you got placed. Okay. Do you know how much an umpire did receive for a game? I have no idea. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jerry O'Neill, I uh, had a question on the floor pertaining to people who did play ball and eventually ended up uh, being the umpires also. Good. Could you identify yourself, please? Yeah, Ronnie Huntsman again. Uh, I did umpire with Roger Yost, and I don't remember all the different umpires, but we umpired quite a few games over the years. I believe that we probably got anywhere from 10 to $15, I think $25, and we split that. And Roger usually wanted to play it, so I had the bases, but uh, the home umpire usually got more, but Roger said, no, you've got to split it. So. Okay. But uh, later on, uh, I think we were getting around thirty, forty dollars even okay. in the last couple of years that I am. But uh, I can't remember <coughs> just who on. I think Wayne. I don't know Wayne on, but okay, very good. Thank you. Hey, gentleman, raise his hand. He'll identify himself. Go right ahead. Well, Leonard. Um, after I quit managing, I went into umpiring in the uh, well. It's, Cleveland team is now in what's called the East Shore League. Uh, when I started, we were getting uh, we were getting thirty dollars a game, and I think I umpired for about eight or 
or nine, maybe ten years. And when, when I finished, then uh, we were up to fifty dollars a game, which I thought was a real gift because it, to me, it was just the love of the game. I, I'd have done it for nothing, but they kept paying me. So what are you going to do? <laughs> I, but I do think that right now, I believe it's sixty dollars an umpire now, so it's one hundred and twenty bucks for two umpires now per game. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it, it has gone up a little bit over the years. Got a question for you, Lenny. As for, uh, Wally, uh, as far as uh, tough games or close calls that uh, erupted into a little argument, uh, anything like that that you ran across? Not too much. It, uh, I always felt that it helped me having played for, basically played about 24 years. And almost every situation that could come up had come up beforehand. So that helped when you're, you know, it didn't rattle you too much. Okay. Once in a while you see some guys that get a little shook up with something, but I, you could always, and I personally, I didn't have a problem. If I felt I missed the play, I would kind of get the uh, the opposing coach, the guy that was yelling, and tell him, I'm sorry, I just didn't quite see it. You know, and mm -hmm. that's kind of the end of the argument. What are you going to do? Sorry. Nobody ever came out with a gun, so I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We got a gentleman here who will raise his hand. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Dale, Dale Wagner, Cleveland. It always did help that Wally left his white cane in the dugout before he went out to umpire too, so, so we didn't give him such a hard time. But uh, I did have a little story about two of the guys here that did some umpiring years ago. It was uh, Jimmy Brust and Wayne Vogel were a team years ago, and I kind of specifically remember one game. I was pitching, and they got a pretty good game going, but there was close calls, and... Uh, we were playing Valors that day, and uh, the coach, the mo opposing coach was uh, Denny Rue. And I don't know, I didn't know about this, as kind of the inside of baseball. And there was a play at third or whatever it was, and I think Wayne had the bases, but, and Denny come out of the dugout and started arguing. And you should have seen Jim Bruss running with all this umpire's gear, the shin guards. He's running up the line, Wayne is running towards Denny. They, they had to see who could throw Denny out of the game first, because they had, they had drinks, I believe, bet on it, wasn't it, Jim? <laughs> yeah, four <laughs> drinks, and uh, well, we got Denny out of the game, and that kind of seemed to help us, or he was always a no nosy guy, or noisy anyhow, but, uh, but this was their pregame workout. They were going to get Denny. Remember, Wayne? <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, I got a gentleman here who raised his hand. Go right ahead, please. This is Ken Angel again on umpiring. I was told once from a guy that did a lot of umpiring, the umpire is always right unless the rule book says he's wrong. <laughs> ah, very good, thank you. Okay, you got a gentleman in there who raised his hand. He'll identify himself. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Fred Jacoby. Uh, I have here uh, a bunch of uh, little notes that I took out of a very complete uh, scrapbook that Kathy Wagner kept in 1950. And uh, you'll see the names come up over and over, so I'll just read through them uh, quickly from various games during the season. Uh, one note was, Houts took a lead in the South because of two forfeits by Manitowoc, uh, and that put Cleveland out of first in South, it says. And there's a question there. This Manitowoc team has some players that apparently have signed with another team, and they continued to play, and they lost the games, even though they, they forfeit the games, even though they won the games. Oh, okay. Uh, then uh, another game was Cleveland 3, St. Nazians 2. Cleveland scored a thrilling ninth inning win over St. Nazians when Cleveland came to bat in the first of the ninth. Jebo uh, and Semph walked. Uh, Prowl and Henschel hit game-winning singles. Semph allowed three hits. Cleveland had six hits. Another game, Cleveland 5, Manny 1. Semph scattered five hits, striking out 11. Cleveland had 10 hits. Uh, another game, I think it, this is another game, uh, Houts won, won 10. And lost two. Cleveland won eight and lost three. That must have been the season. Huh? Uh, Cleveland four, and then the Vikings. Mm. My typist, I think, left something out. Uh, Semph had shutouts, uh, scattered six hits, fan 12. Wagner and Semph hit doubles. Mantorak had a forfeit because ineligible player. See, another, that came up a couple of times in these clippings. All-star game. Here it is. Ken Crest, junior mentor, will head to South. That's announcing the lineups. Uh, Hank Semph. Pitcher Jeebo and Wagner infielders. Yeah, Hank's have a pitcher. A dying outfield. That's what I read before, I think. And then there must have been a pitcher from Valders that 
people that were playing then must have known well Frank Trinka. Mm -hmm. He must have been a bad boy. Oh, boy. Oh, Isn't it? Seven. A, a lot of written about Frank Trinka in these articles that year. Uh, so anyway, uh, the South won. That was uh, Kenny's team here. And then another game, uh, Cleveland 11, Morrison 7. Semp and Lutze gave up nine hits. Dine and Grote led the hitting. And then another game, Cleveland 9, Two Rivers 2. Semp allowed five hits. Prowl had a triple and a double. Crescent Dine had doubles. Cleveland had 15 hits. Another game, Cleveland 1, Kellersville 2. Semp went the route. Allowed four hits. Fandy 11 walked six. And then another game, Cleveland 7, Valders 2. Siegert allowed two hits. Yost collected the two hits for Cleveland, and Cleveland's 11 and 5, uh, runner up in the South. And that was all out of Kathy Wagner's scrapbook. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we got a gentleman here who could read it off a little bit. Well, I wasn't planning on reading it off. It just gives the umpire fees for. The season 68, huh? 48. 48, 48, 48, 48 yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was for the year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, there's more than that. Top part is some stationary and stuff. Uh, general expenses, I guess. Uh, Kenny had another clipping here that he was going to have me ask if I'd read these before. Um, uh, Bob Wagner, 296. These are batting averages. Got right work, but what, what year? What year, please? Uh, four, did you say this was the 49? 48 for nine? Uh, Jimmy Dine, 308. Kenny Crest, 348. Ronnie Prowl, 333. Kenny Henschel, 306. Roger Yost, 121. Oh. Milton Ewald, 244. Hank Semp, 240. Marvin Seeger, 200. I can't make this one out. Can't make that email. Deezing. Deezing? Mm -hmm. Which teasing is that? Um. Doesn't make much difference. He, di he didn't get any hits. <laughs> 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 and then uh, James, James, yeah. 235. Adrian Zill, uh, 0 02, he didn't get any hits. Uh, Stan, Stan Henschel, 0. Wallace Pagel, 200. Alden Woodland, well, I don't know what that is. It's 2 or 300, something like that. And then uh, Bill Rutherford, was that Billy, I suppose, mm -hmm. 143. So it gives you an idea. There are always a bunch of good hitters there. Anything on the cost for the league at this point? Well, you j just we'll leave it at that, that uh, he had this sheet from 40 to 49 showing the league expenses, and it was about $340 or something. Okay, very good. Oh, Thank you. Oh, is it? 384. 384. That was for the whole season. For the Mandro County Baseball League Financial Report, 1948. <coughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. We got a young lady who's going to read off some names of a picture we're uh, having on display. And uh, go right ahead and identify yourself, please. Okay, my name is Jeanette Lutze. This picture was taken at Wimler's Park, August 18th of 1957. On the left is Ron Huntsman, and Jesse is next to him and Dorothy Vogel, they're sitting on the back bench. And then Bob Wagner and Gene Lutze, he's kind of in the back, okay. Alan Stultzman, Pete Wagner, and the guy, I think the number on the back of his uniform is three, and we do not know who that is. Yeah, yeah, sure. Is that Ken? Okay. And then we, we thought little girl game. was hiding in the back. <laughs> what? But, okay, so that takes care of that picture. Okay, thank you. That's Pete Wagner. Pete Wagner, okay. And then we'll put this one underneath. Am I there? Yeah. <coughs> this one was taken the same day. Uh, going from the left, walking off the field, is Ron Huntsman, Laverne Lancho, Ben Yost, Bob Wagner, Gene Lutze, and Alan Stultzman. And that one's in the dugout. Um, Harold Wimler, we don't know who the first guy is, and then Harold Wimler is there. 
John Logan has got his arm up in the air. Uh, Gene is in there, Ronnie Huntsman, and Pete Wagner. Now, your husband, was he on the ball team? Yes, he is. And uh, were you dating him at the time he was playing? <laughs> yes, I was. You were? Yes, and okay. when we got married in 58, and by 59, we had a family. So we brought them along, and they went to the ball game too. Very good, very good. And most of my pictures at that time were of the kids. We didn't take baseball players anymore. <laughs> Did you consider him a hero? Of course. <laughs> well, I got to pay her off. <laughs> what position did he play? He was a pitcher. He was a pitcher. Oh, okay. Was he a very anxious person when it was his turn to take the mound? Never. He was very calm. Okay. <laughs> very good. Thank you. The young lady who's uh, going to help out here a little bit by uh, talking about a picture that's on display. Right ahead, please. Okay, Jeanette, let's see again. Thank you. This picture was taken June 11th of 1978 at an old-timers game. And I remember the guys lined up on the first base line from home plate. And we do not know who all the people are because they were not necessarily on the same team. They were through the years. Okay. So I gave them each a number. And if anybody knows that's me, let me know so that I can fill in some names. Good. I know number one is Ron Huntsman, and I and I know my husband has a blue shirt. He's just in front of the church, Gene Lutzi. Um, but anybody who knows who they are, you can come over later and tell me who you are. Good. I can ask Kathy, do you think Bobby is the one in the shorts, wearing a short yellow shirt? Because that's who we thought. I read some names. Go right ahead, please. Tim Chris again. Thank you, Ken. Roger Yost is on the left, and then Kramer and myself, and then there's a Leonard and Wally Leonard and Gene Lutzi. Okay, thank you. Any year on this picture? All right, this is um, Cleveland baseball team, July 12, 1959, Cleveland 4, Francis Creek 2. Uh, uh, left to right in the front was Dick Wickman, uh, Gary Schneider, Tim Brust, Wayne Vogel, Gary Mayer, Eric Wagner. In the back, Harold Wimler, Wally Leonard, Alan Tippert, Grant Mayer, Gene Lutze, Ron Huntsman, and Carmen Chizek. You got the floor. Keep them on. Gary Mayer is in Denver. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Got a gentleman raised his hand. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Richard Wiegand. I remember at one of the games I was in Cleveland where one of the opposition players hit a home run to right field, and it went through the uh, upper, it was a glass door. I think it was on Ralph Yost's house. Uh, the upper story went, hit a glass door and broke it, went through it. Remember that as clear as a bell today. Uh, the other comment I had was somebody was talking about trying out for the major leagues. I actually did meet um, Joe Hauser, who lived in Sheboygan, and he was a retired major league player, and I think he died when he was 98. He had a sports shop somewhere in Sheboygan, and I drove in one day, and. When I was there, I went to see him in the sports shop, and I asked him about his major league career. And uh, he played in the 1920s. Um, he was a very good player. I think he ended, his career ended with an injury. Uh, after about six or seven years, he played for the Philadelphia Athletics, and he told me some stories I don't remember about playing against Ruth Cobb, Walter Johnson, and those kind of guys. So. Um, I did dig out his major league record at some point uh, some years ago. I don't have it here, but he was a major leaguer who was living in Sheboygan and retired. Very good. Thank you. Got a gentleman here who uh, raised his hand and uh, he has some recall. Go right ahead, please. This is Ron Prawl. I recall Joe Hauser and I recall one time going to the, his sports shop, which was on A Street in, in Sheboygan, kind of right next to the old Sheboygan Theater. And uh, he uh, 
I, w I went in there and I was going to buy a new bat. And I picked up the bat and I started well, kind of trying to indicate a little bit of a swing. And he got all excited about that. You're going to break my display table. You're going to break my display table. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I recall that very, very well. But he, he was a, a very good player in, uh, back in the... Uh, 20s and 30s, right? Okay, very good. Thank you. Do one uh, more time, please. One more time. Betty Kress. Thank you. Ken has a baseball that was signed by Joe Hauser. I believe Joe came to Central High School and asked, well, whatever he was doing there, but he must have asked the student body how many, how many ways there were to get on first base. And Kenny answered it, and he got um, oh. uh, the ball okay. signed by Joel. Okay. And I think there were four or five different ways that it, it is uh, the way to get on the sure. first base. Sure. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, you can introduce yourself, please. Hi, Gene. Let's see. Just a couple things. Our super training programs, before and after the games, or after practices, <laughs> we practice Tuesday and Thursday nights. And we played till we couldn't see the ball anymore. And then we'd go to Wilmer's and we'd have to have a beer or two, some planters peanuts in those little bags that you probably paid a nickel for. Okay. And then you'd have to have some ice cream. And that's when Harold Wimler got his flashlight out so he could see where the cooler or freezer was so he could get the ice cream for you guys. <laughs> that, that was our training during the week. And then, of course, after the game, we all went to the clubhouse and we iced down our arms and all, oh, no, that's not our team. <laughs> uh, the only reason... The only part we used the ice for was to put them in a wash tub and put the keg of beer in there to keep it cold. <laughs> Very good. I like that training schedule. <laughs> okay, we have a, a picture of a baseball team on the screen, and uh, someone is going to start to read them off. From what direction are we going? Uh, I was Wally Leonard again. This was our championship team in 1968. We'll start at the bottom row left. Okay. If I remember them all. I think it's Alan Stoltzman, then uh, Jerry Gutschel, Lon Galley, Brian Windler, Eric Batory, Randy Vandaloo, um, Lloyd Stoltzman, Jerry Henschel, and Jim Lallemont, I think is the last guy on the right. In the back row, we have Jim Cullen, uh, is that Jerry Stelsman? No, Jerry's the third one. Who's the second? Gene Weber. Eugene Weber's the second one, and Jerry Stelsman, and Jim Bross, myself, Gene Priggy, Jeff Leschke, Stan Charmbrook, and Dan Weisskopf. The only championship team that I ever coached. Okay. Very good. Good memory. Thank you. Okay, we have a young lady who is the spark plug of our group, and uh, I guess she'd like to convey some thank yous and so forth. Go right ahead, please. I want to thank everybody for coming and being so willing to share the information. It was absolutely wonderful. I do have one comment. We went to Point Creek one time. We walked it off the park. It was shared, I think, and Joyce was along. And I think we had a hard time finding the baseball diamond, if I was correct. We thought it was on one side of the river. No, we thought it was on the other side of the river. Which side of the creek was it? North, north. It was on the north side, but we could not tell that anymore. It had all grown over. So uh, we will be meeting again next month. And I want to again thank Frederick and everyone for coming to take to take time out in their busy schedule. So we hope you all join us again next month. I think we are going to have the uh, fishing game. We'll be here next month. Unless somebody has more that they want to talk about baseball. Frederick, you want to? Well, um, I just want to thank everybody for coming. A, a turnout is uh, really great. Uh, a couple people that thought they could come obviously didn't make it, but most people did. So it's probably the largest meeting I've ever seen uh, for this organization. Again, I thank you very much. Okay. And as a videographer, I'm just uh, going to pan. Is that the, is, you want to yeah. talk about yeah. that? Yeah. If we could get copies of all the pictures, I would appreciate it very much so I can set up a file on baseball. So we have this on record, and someday we want to have them housed, all, all the materials housed somewhere. So thank you if you do that for me. 
before anybody leaves, I, we're going to have the camera pan so everybody stays in their seat until the camera goes all the way around the room, and then you can stay and visit off camera. Okay. And tell the real stories. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Okay, one more comment. Okay, one more comma, comment. Here we go. Uh, Richard Wiegand, um, there are DVDs from these meetings that have appeared at Lakeshore Technical College in the library downstairs here. And there's between 80 and 100 DVDs. I looked today, going back to the first meeting, and the subject material for the, the event is on there. So if you want to check it out and see what we've been up to over the years, uh, feel free to do so. This meeting obviously will become a DVD at some point. Okay. Okay. Uh, Fred Jacoby, I, w I wanted to mention, I don't know if everyone understood, that we have a long distance award, and I think it goes to Ronnie Prow. He and his wife came out from Madison for this meeting. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Let's have an applause for that one. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to do the pan right now. So I'll start with Mr. Bauer, and there'll be a music behind this. So music? Yeah, there'll be music behind this of some kind. Take me out to the ball game, perhaps? Yeah, we could have sang it. I brought the Hey, how about that? Hey, why don't we do that? Let's do that. <laughs> We're going to sing, take me out to the ball game, okay? <laughs> Everybody, let her go. Let's start her out. see the course right there. There we go. Hey. There. Okay. Just the first. <laughs> Which Let's just do chorus one. Okay. Okay. okay chorus number. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I ever get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes are out at the old. One more time, one more time, one more time, one more time. Out at the 